Uh, a German magazine wrote some, some years ago that Chief Evangelist is the most unnecessary title in software industry. So I'm really happy to have it after I'm working for that for 15 years. So now I have the freedom to talk about all the things I would like to talk and nobody's uh, say you have uh, responsibility for business value or whatever. So yeah, I was blamed today sometimes that I'm one of the guys that is responsible for the, uh, for the burying of the ECM branch. And literally, if it's really like that, I'm quite happy that it works because I guess the ECM term was limiting us very much in our vision of, of new software technology. So when I start thinking about the uh, presentation, I just found these nice guys. Maybe some of them know you. The movie's already old. It's Doc Emmett Brown from Back to the Future. And, and in the last movie, he said, uh, your future is whatever you make of it, so make it a good one. And that's very important. So the future, especially in IT, is, is not written down yet, but there are so many current uh, ideas in the market and we really can adopt them for our daily business. But to do that, I like to quote another one, a great guy. Uh, he was a, a very colorful writer, Mark Twain, and he said, the secret of getting ahead is getting started. And when I see some of the customers and some of the uh, companies out there in the market, they don't start. They don't start to adopt new technology. They still stick to, let's say, last century technology and solutions. But I guess that's a failure because from, from my point of view, technology changes everything. I won't talk about technology that much today. I will talk about cultural changes and values and other things. But basically, technology will change everything. I'm absolutely sure about that. So, who am I? I'm uh, 45, I'm chief technology evangelist, member of the board, have four children, I play golf. I like to disrupt my customers with uh, crazy ideas for many, many years, and I do that now for 28 years in the market, so I guess I can talk a little bit more about disruption and changing. But I guess to, to understand where we have to go, it's very, very important to see where we're coming from. And that's just the development of, of a technology, let's say, in the last 20 years. 20 years ago, we have, no, 25, okay, we have uh, music cassettes, we have Walkman, um, somebody maybe remember Walkman, it was a small cassette player, even some of you don't remember what is a cassette, but okay, we had that before, MP3 files and smartphones. And I asked a question, last conference I've been, I asked somebody, did you know what was the most used app to the football world championship in 2004? you have any idea? The most used app on the football championship in 2004? There was no app, there was no smartphone at all. That's, that's a trap because Apple invented the smartphone in 2007, but nobody's thinking of it. So really, we can see how technology changes our daily business, uh, our daily life for all of us. Who, whom of you is not having a smartphone? Is there someone without a smartphone? No, okay. Some, sometimes there's somebody that says, yeah, I, I, I have a, no smartphone. But really, uh, honestly, that's... Uh, pretty seldom now in the market. So where are we coming from? If you just have a look at the social change, my parents started somewhere here called the Lost Generation. We were born before or during Second World War. Uh, they really had problems surviving all over Europe at that time. So they had pretty different values than we had. They, were, uh, they liked to eat something every day. That was very important. They liked to have a home. They liked to have a car. And they liked to communicate face to face. And then there was the baby boomer generation. They were a little bit more happy in their life. I, I belong to the Generation X. So I was born in 1964. Um, I, yeah, I really knew the, the, there was a new technology born like MTV uh, or, or other stuff. So I, I had a PC, the first one I could buy. They were really expensive. I know the first time in my study, I had an Apple II computer and would like to buy a hard disk. And there was one hard disk on the market with the fantastic space of five megabytes on the hard disk. It was an eight-inch hard disk, and the price of it was 4,500 Deutschmark, so much more expensive than the whole computer, and I never could afford it. So I bought a disk drive with, uh, I don't know, floppy disks, five-quarter-inch uh, storage capacity, I think 128 kilobytes, something like that. So impossible much of storage on it. And then we, we see the generation Y that's now already in business. They get used to new technology. They, they have the idea of bringing your own device and the other things. And now generation that, like my children, is coming to the market. And they don't care how technology is working. They just use us. They love to use technology, but they really have no idea how this technology is working. 
They only want to make their life better with it. And that's very important for us. If we, as software companies, find out that these are the guys and girls that buy our software later on, they just use us. They want to have sexy solutions. And um, let's say there are a lot of business software commonly used out in the market, for instance, like, yeah, let's say SAP. It's a good example. It's really powerful, but it's not sexy, not at all. And it's really a hard time using it. You have to learn a lot of stuff. And these, the trends to new and, tech, new, new and sexy technology are not that young. So this, is, this was a very sophisticated workplace in the 60s. You had a computer terminal with a screen. You have your personal cloud storage. Okay, it was a tape drive, but it was personal. I could store information on it. And um, you see, good design survives here in the corner. You can still buy these chairs. So uh, they were really ahead of the time. You have a telephone, so this was a workplace, and at that time people had an idea of working mobile. That was the vision in the 60s, right? It was a science fiction movie, okay. Uh, so this was mobile communication. You had a, yeah, a, a CRT screen, you have a telephone, you have a keyboard. All this would not work because this was just a moniker cut off, so there were no flat screens. Uh, this would never work. And, and the impression of the telephone, if you just make it larger, they it's like a dial. These are buttons, but nobody had the idea that the dial of a telephone could look different. So they just make buttons, but in the, in the form of a dial. That was great. And that was how technology should look like. Then we came to the 90s around millennium. We have usual workplaces. We had Microsoft Windows. We had new technology. We had laser printers. We had mouses. We had Word, Office. We had integration. Everybody know these kind of workplaces. And at that time, there was another idea of mobile working. That was a Microsoft idea of a mobile computer with a head-mounted device with the Prisma and here a Windows XP touchscreen. You don't see the batteries the lady is carrying around and the rest of the PC, but who? Luckily, this was not the future of mobile computing. Can you imagine everybody of you running around with such a device? You would all look like Borgs from Star Trek. So, uh, resistance is futile. We will assimilate you. No. This was just an idea, and fortunately, it did not work. So we come to workplaces like today. Um, most of you might have two or three screens on their workplace. We still have printers, unfortunately. I guess uh, they can be eliminated later on, but we will see. Uh, you have mouses, you have mobile devices, you have bring your own device, you use tablets. If you have a very rich company, you might have a workplace like that. You can buy this already. This is already outdated, it's from the last year, there's a new version of it. And I personally like this identification of the coffee mug and the inductive heating of the coffee mug. So your coffee will be always hot when you put it on the screen. Great invention for technology. Never have to run back to the kitchen to get a hot coffee. Um, if you want to have these, they're around, I don't know, 20,000 euros, something like that. You can buy workplaces like that. Um, very innovative, but not the end of the line. In the near future, we will see all these devices with mixed reality, artificial uh, reality, and all the other things. This is a very, very interesting device, especially this is a HoloLens from Microsoft, but there are a lot of lookalikes. And the idea is that you can virtually steer uh, other people. This is a steady sitting at home and guiding his girl, uh, repairing the plumbing. I wouldn't know what my water would do if she would call me and say, fix it. Uh, so she wouldn't use a device like that, but that's okay. But um, if, if you just, uh, maybe you read the note that Apple bought recently the uh, world largest supplier of, of lenses for artificial devices in China. So uh, there is a good estimate that Apple will show an own artificial or uh, augmented reality device in, in the next two or three years, and that will be a breakthrough for sure for this kind of technology. So if you never thought about it, just get adopted to it. Um, so aren't we already completely digital? Like, yeah, we're doing it in the video side. We have website, we have social media, we have mobile devices, we have virtual reality. Uh, not, not really. So there's one, still one obstacle in the way of using complete digitized cloud technology, and that's really something like internet access. I just got some numbers from the European Statistic Organization, and they say, okay, only yeah, 75% of the world population has uh, the possibility to use internet and on mobile devices. And if you switch to stationary devices, it's only half of the people in the world that have access to internet based on 
uh, on devices of any kind. So if you have a cloud solution and all your computation power and all your data and all your information is stored in the cloud and you don't have access, so it won't work. That's one of the obstacles we still have to overcome for cloud technology. So whenever you talk about cloud, just see that the solutions you'd like to use are still able to be used offline. So it's very important that you can have data, you're just working on it offline on your devices because you don't have internet everywhere. But that's just one advice for cloud technology. So what happens in the internet? Um, that's another uh, Statista slide. I really love it. So there will be uh, two million minutes of call with Skype. There are, that's a very important number. Just remember that 87,000 hours of video streamed by Netflix. There are around uh, search, uh, what is Google, 38 million search requests, much more messages sent, over 29 million messages sent by messages like Threema or WhatsApp or whatever. Uh, so interesting, and this is another nice 18,000 matches by Tinder. Don't know where everybody I know says I don't use that, but there should be a demand for it if there are 18,000 matches a minute, just, just an internet minute. So a lot of stuff happens, and most of these things are cloud-based. So from the status quo, we don't think analog anymore. If you're analog in your key processes, you're already dead. Companies that don't have digital processes are already dead. Um, we try to reduce some of the old analog stuffs we still have, like paper or old archive. And we already think digital, but we don't do that really in, in, in a good way. We, we do not combine processes and digital ideas to a global global idea for a so digital agenda. It's a nice, uh, it's, it's a political term, I guess, but I really like it. You, do, you have to have a digital agenda. Otherwise, it will happen something to you that's not very nice. You will be a victim of the digital Darwinism. You will just die out. Some companies already did that. So as soon as your technology and the society evolves faster than you can do as a company, you don't have a chance to survive in the market. So this is just a question to our organization, not to your technology. But technology will change everything. And these are techniques already died out. We have analog films, we have cassettes, we have video cassettes. You have, this was a status in the office in the 80s. Every secretary needs to have one of these IBM typewriters that was state-of-the-art technology. You could exchange the, the type uh, wheel to, to do other fonts, so wow. That was amazing stuff of technologies. What heavy it was, rock-sized, you could carry it around. Nobody's using it anymore, except German police. They still have typewriters in their offices because they don't have good computer technology. So they are extincted. All this stuff is extincted. Same with, with uh, special technology. You have a new client-server architecture from the last century. Maybe you knew it, but it's gone from the market. There is no technology like that anymore, hopefully. There is no technology. And now we're talking about something like we're still using three or multi-tier architecture. That's, yeah, okay, you're still using that. But is that technology you can use from the cloud? It's idea from the last century. Is that ready for your future? I don't think so, and I will give you an opportunity to that. But just have, look at some other companies that already starved from their disability to adopt to new technology. This is uh, a German company. Blockbuster Video it was one of the market leaders in, in, in renting videos, yeah, extinctic from the market. They don't have an online platform, other things, Borders, Kodak, one of the really good technology companies, away, no, no. They just said nobody will use digital cameras, so we still can produce analog films. Uh, that thing. Or one of the most known companies in the market, for instance, Nokia. They had the technology, the Nokia communicator. Did someone, one of you, had a Nokia communicator? It was one of the most sophisticated pieces of technology at that time. And the killer feature of the Nokia communicator, you remember the killer feature of the Nokia communicator? It was a fax. You could send and receive faxes with it. So you had secure business communication on the Nokia communicator. And then Nokia came up with the idea of a smartphone. And they said, well, we have the smartphone. And uh, the runtime of the battery is only nine hours. Nobody will use a phone with nine hours battery lifetime. And Apple said, okay, the first runtime of the iPhone was around five hours something, but there are always plugs in the wall. So just carry around your 
your charging device and use it. So they came to the market, Nokia didn't. Nokia was extended from the market as a telephone company. And this will happen to some other companies too. There is something that is called the Schumpeterian creative destruction. This Mr. Schumpeter was a philosopher and, and uh, yeah, um, a science uh, guy from, from the early 30s. And he said, most of the companies will die out through disruption. He was the first one that combined economic theories with the term of disruption. He said, there will always be entrepreneurs in the market with a new idea that will challenge established companies. And you don't have a look at these established or these entrepreneurs in the market. They will disrupt your business. And uh, it's likely that it happens that you will be bored or your business will just discontinue and you have to close your company. This was 1938. Then he invented that theory, and it was uh, first published in 1942. So he was a really interested and intelligent guy with a look to the future. And one of these calculations is that uh, from the current 500 fortune, from 500 companies in, in 2027, 75% will be away. Maybe they are bought, but maybe they are not existing anymore. If you had a look at the Fortune 500 companies from 1955, there are still nine of them, nine of 500 in the Fortune 500 list. The rest died out or was bought from other competitors. So be careful what happens in the market. This could happen to you too. And in the reality, do we do digital disruption? No, we still use stuff from the last century without legacy application and other stuff. But this will not answer the questions and challenges we will have for the future. So the first thing is how can we handle the explosion of the content? We just talked about content pretty much today, and content means every kind of electronic information. It's just growing. So it's growing dramatically every day. It will be a quadruple in the next four years from the estimate of the analysts. So there will be uh, an interesting analogy, a stockpile of iPads. Currently, all the amount of stored data in the world is a stockpile of iPads, a point eight of the 0.8 of the distance Earth to Moon. In 2022, it will be a stockpile of 4.6, the distance from Earth to Moon. Good business for Apple, uh, if they really can deliver all these iPads. Yeah, but that's very important. So you need to have software, if you buy it today, that will be able to answer the questions you even don't know yet. But you will surely have in five years how to handle these content and all the other information. The other thing is there are new ways of working, so you won't limit your the people working in your company by, let's say, a PC or um, a software that is only be operational under Windows or some other operating system. So eliminate the need for these stuff. Think about mobile, think about international, think about working around the clock. So if you think about software that should be able to support all these ways of working. And last point, Uli pointed it out today, collaboration is, becomes much more important in the future. You don't work alone. You always work with other people. So your software should be able to do that, whatever software it is. And think about new infrastructure. Think about mobile devices, responsive design, distributed location, cloud, IT integration, uh, low cost of ownership. You don't want to have expensive infrastructure. So cloud is a good way to have cheap infrastructure at your hands. And then I run over these guys. Maybe you see I have some, some movie quotes. Um, this is Deadpool, and he said, uh, I'm going to do to you what Limp Biscuit did to music in the late 90s, a nice quote uh, in some of the movies. And, and the technology that is doing that, Uli already mentioned it, I'm quite sure it will be the killer of the music, so of the other IT, and that's microservice architecture. So I don't know if you uh, really come in the way of microservice architecture, but the basic principle is that you just break up all the other uh, large services you might have in your system and just split them up into single small services that can be run separately, that can be developed separately, that can be exchanged and that can be extended. So if you have a microservice platform, for instance, um, there are free platforms of them like Netflix. That's why I said Netflix. If you really have the need for just distributing and storing a huge amount of data, you can use, for instance, the Netflix platform. They can currently deliver to hundreds of millions of users high definition video so they surely will be able to handle your office documents or your statistical information from your ERP system so that's for instance a possible platform and then you need something 
uh, your software supplier doesn't have, let's say, a signature service or an intelligent metadata service. You need a structure service for the folders. You don't have it. It's no problem at all. Just look for somebody who can supply you a microservice. The microservice will perfectly fit into this infrastructure. It has a described interface. It can be used with all the other microservices. But for that, there are some requirements. All these software has to have an API. So look at something like a term API first or headless. If you're talking about software, it should be able to be used without a client environment or a rich client or something else. That's very important if we talk about platforms. Look, if it uses standard technology, you have already developers that can use HTML, Angular, something like that. So if there is a framework and that has an API, it should be able to be used by standard technology you already know. Low level, low entry hurdle, just, just a technology your people already can use in your company. It should be based on standard technology like Spring Cloud, Netflix, whatever. Um, just ask your vendor about something like containerization, another nice feature in the future. Um, maybe some of you heard about Docker containers. These are virtually a new distribution uh, methods for software that can deliver a complete system. And uh, Kubernetes, for instance, is something to run these containers. And if you have an infrastructure based on that, you literally don't need Windows or something like that anymore. You can easily distribute solutions like that natively in a cloud, in an Amazon Cloud, Google Cloud, Azure, whatever. So this is an application that can be run in every cloud solution. And then you really don't have a need of some SQL servers or something like that anymore. So it's really sophisticated technology. And even large companies like SAP adopt to that. There is the Hybris Cloud from SAP, their own idea of bringing microservices. The Fiori apps are based on Angular. So if you use SAP, if you use Fiori, you already have developers for such kind of technology. But this is the key to good cloud solution because microservices have elasticity built in, they have immortality built in, they have scalability built in. So from my point of view, this is the way software should look in the future. So if you really try to migrate your software, we heard about migration, it's always a hard time, but if you migrate, change your technology. Look about microservice platforms, they're really extend, infin, almost infinite extensibility. So you have to do that from your organizational part, otherwise it's not working. So you have to become visionary. Um, this needs to be a decision by the management in your company. If you ask your IT guys, would you like to change technologies? And no, it's working, it's working fine, it's working since 20 years. Yeah, maybe I knew, uh, I would like to add some some memory, or I would like to exchange some hard disks to SSDs, but no, don't touch it, it's running. So don't ask them. They will tell you, no, microservice technology is oh, visionary, it's not working, we can't use it, uh, we don't migrate our software technology, we don't want to move to the cloud. So digitalization starts as part of the company's strategy, otherwise you won't be able to change anything. And digitalization is a matter for the board. Only the management in your company can decide where to go, so you need really visionary management. And then another very important thing, it should be tasty, so everybody should use it. Don't, don't build solutions that are yeah, best of the breed, but really not usable. So, so users would say, yeah, what is it? It's a crappy piece of software with some, let's say, I don't know, a, a rich client installable under Windows. It looks like Outlook in the 90s. No, that's, it's not sexy. People don't want that anymore especially in the mobile sector. Nobody wants to work with such software. So think about solutions that can be run in a microservice environment. Best of breed in microservice environments is quite easy because you just select special microservices you deploy in your platform and that deliver you business value. And most of them are cheap and if you're lucky, you can find them in the GitHub repository for free. For instance, we are using some, 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 some tools usually for, for business Intelligence is a good term, yeah. We use Kibana. Kibana is a free software for analyzing data. It brings you great dashboards, costs nothing. Good stuff. Really, it's not easy to use, but it's easy to use for somebody who's a little bit uh, affected by IT, by, by IT technology. And adjust all that very carefully. Make it sexy. If it's hard to use, nobody will use it. And last but not least, think about the workplace so people like to have a nice environment. I don't know if someone of you visited the new headquarter of Microsoft in Munich already. They have 
I think they have 1,400, 1,600 employees in Germany, and they have place for around 1,000 people working at the same time. So if you're in the office for more than three days, somebody will ask you what you're doing here. Why don't you work from home? This is only for teams and collaboration events and maybe for some of the people in support, although they have to be there in the office. But it's mobile, it's a clean environment, it's good, it's, it's a sexy environment. And for instance, um, your, your today metaphor, today the work is where I am, will change. The work is where, uh, the work is, I am where my work is, sorry, I don't know my own presentation. It will change to the work is where I am, especially with mobile. And you can do something in your own office. These are just some impressions from our offices. We changed the environment to a more open space. And um, this, for instance, is a good tip. We bought that from a company that does exhibition booths. If you buy that from a, yeah, from a brand uh, supplier of office equipment, it's horribly expensive. But if you go to a company that do using these exhibition booths and that, I need a table like that, you pay less than for a usual work desk because they're used to build such nice things. And uh, yeah, they don't last more than 10 years, but that's okay, they are cheap, so you can buy them later on in a different form or different color. Just a good tip. Or you can do something like that. You need communication spaces, you need open light, you need movable offices. This is our office in Constance. Uh, they have a good view. Uh, honestly, that is how other people make their holidays, working in Constance, but okay. Uh, lucky them. But for all this, there is one thing. You need the three magic words. That, that is working. You have to be fast and you have to be fearless to do that and you have to be flexible in your thinking. And um, by that, I just... Uh, got the idea from another guy, he compared that to the Vikings. The Vikings were fast and fearless and flexible. They, yeah, they already, they terrorized Europe over 400 years. Uh, and so everybody said, well, keep them away from me. They go up the Rhine to, a, to Aachen, for instance, and they were really hard, uh, hard enemies over Europe. And why? Because technology changes everything. They had a new technology. They had a device where they could navigate over the sea without seeing the sun. All the other uh, sailors at that time need the sun or the stars to navigate. And they, had, uh, they, they just found out that there are some crystals you can use to uh, bipolarization to find out where the sun is. So they built these sun compass and were able to navigate directly over the sea. So they didn't need the coast anymore. They could go everywhere they liked to. Uh, and they did that because they were fearless and they were flexible and they were fast. And so they conquered almost Europe, and they had another great technology, just ships. They could just adjust their sails to every direction of the wind, or they could row it. They have these high boards, so if you uh, like to attack a ship like that, it was really a hard time, usually you lose. Uh, so they had two sophisticated technologies, and they used it. So they almost go all over the world. They discovered America and some other countries, and then suddenly, Around 1100, they stopped. They settled down in England, and they built the foundation for the current democracy and for other rules. And they completely adopted to another strategy because after 400 years of terror, the rest of Europe said, it's enough. So at that time, if they didn't adopt to a new kind of thinking, they would have been disrupted by the others. But they were clever, and they were fearless, and they were flexible. So they adopted and found it our democratic rules today based on some of their ideas. So, really interesting guys at that time. So, compare yourself about the Vikings and uh, start with digitalization, but digitalization will be like tattoos. It won't go away. Whenever you start with it, it will last forever, but there's only one last advice. Do it and go to the cloud. Be fast, be fearless and be flexible and you will have a great future because you made it for yourself. Thank you very much for listening.